Amen. So 2 Corinthians chapter 6, um, the part I want to look at there is verse 14. And keep something there for the evening. We'll be coming back and forth. But it says there, Be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. And the title of the sermon this evening is Stranger Danger. Stranger Danger. And I'm going to get into why I've called it that here in a minute. But I want us to look first and see that Scripture warns us uh, throughout to not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. And you're there in 2 Corinthians 6, but I'll remind you that this is a principle that's found throughout Scripture. We can even go back to uh, Deuteronomy chapter 22. I'll just read to you from there, where it says, Thou shalt not sow thy vineyard or diverse seeds, lest the fruit of thy seed which thou hast sown and the fruit of thy vineyard be defiled. Thou shalt not plow with an ox and an ass together. Now you say, why does God have such a specific rule that they couldn't take uh, two different types of animals, an ox and an ass, and put them in the same yoke, put them in the same plow, and, do, and have them plow together? I mean, what's the problem there? Well, there's really nothing wrong with that specifically, but God is showing us even as far back as Deuteronomy that, there is that we should not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. God does not want two uh, animals plowing together any more than He wants God's people uh, in the same yoke with unbelievers. That's what I believe he's showing us there in Deuteronomy. Uh, you know, these, these animals, they differ in, different, in size and strength. You know, it's gonna, they're going to be pulling at different strides. They're not going to be working in tandem. They're not going to be working together. And that's a principle that we need to learn from, that we need to be uh, equally yoked, not unequally yoked. And, and that would make the work inefficient. If you have these two different animals, you got one animal. I don't, now, I don't know which one has a bigger gate than the other one. But they're, one's trying to walk faster, one's trying to walk slower. You know, you're going to have a harder time getting a nice straight furrow down that, that uh, piece of land. <coughs> so, and that's the same thing in our own life. When we find ourselves unequally yoked with unbelievers, you know, we're going to be less efficient. Could we possibly get some things done in life? Sure. But, you know, a lot of times it's, it's going to make things more difficult than they need to be. <coughs> now, if you look there in 2 Corinthians 6, you'll see that he actually gives some examples of things that are opposites. And he uses these examples to express that fact, that they are opposites, just as believers and unbelievers are opposites. He says there in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14, Be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers, for what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? I mean, could two things be further apart from one another? Righteousness and unrighteousness. What communion hath light with darkness? These are opposites. What concord hath Christ with Belial? Of course, Belial being just another name for the devil. Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? So he's saying, you are just as much an opposite as a believer from an unbeliever as light is from darkness. You are just as much opposed as a believer to an unbeliever as, a, uh, as Christ is with Belial, as righteousness with unrighteousness. He goes on and says, Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? Verse 16. Or what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? Now, of course, he goes on there and explains that we are the temple of God. And he says, For ye are the temple of God. As God hath said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Now, keep something there and turn over to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. So we see that God does not want us unequally yoked. God does not want us uh, getting in the yoke with an unbeliever because they are opposites, just as much as light from dark. And he says that the reason for that is is because we are the temple of God. Now what's one way a person can yoke themselves up with an unbeliever today? There's a, there's a way that people are yoking themselves together. Even God's people will get yoked up with an unbeliever. And that's through the means of fornication. He said there, ye are the temple of the living God. You know, that's the truth. You know, God is dwelling in you. His, His Holy Spirit is in you. And it's very important to God that you don't get the temple dirty. When a person goes and commits fornication, that's exactly what they're doing. It'd be no different than if you walked into a literal, physical temple of God, if there were such a thing today on earth, that we would say, oh, this is the temple of God. And you just came in with a pile of trash and just started stroning about in that temple. That's what happens when a person, when a believer, fornicates. They are making God's temple dirty. You don't believe me? Look there in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 6, verse 15. 
Know ye not that your bodies are the members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of an harlot? God forbid. What? Know ye not that that which is joined unto an harlot is one body? For two, saith he, shall be one flesh. But he that is joined to the Lord is one spirit. Flee fornication. Every sin that a man doeth is without the body. But he that committed fornication sinneth against his own body. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. Saying, look, don't commit fornication. Why? Because your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. <clears throat> which is in you, which you have of God. And ye are not your own. For you are bought with the price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit which are God's. So we see that one area that people can sometimes get an unequal yoke with is in this area uh, of fornication. And of course, they, you know, uh, there a lot of times, well, let me just say this, that the answer to that desire that a person has, that natural God-given desire for that relationship is met within marriage. That's what God, the Bible says, the marriage bed is, un, is honorable in all and undefiled. It's undefiled. So if you satisfy that need within marriage, you're not defiling the temple of God. The Bible says it's honorable. That's what God has ordained. It goes on and says, but whoremongers and adulterers, God will judge. So we see then that marriage is a yoke that people enter into, isn't it? That's probably the, the, the most important yoke that you'll ever share with another human being is the yoke of marriage. <clears throat> and that's, it's a yoke that you should desire. You should want that. That should be a goal in your life to have a, mar uh, have a, a, a spouse to help you in this area. <clears throat> because of the fact that it could, if you, if you refuse that, you know, it could lead to fornication. It's very difficult uh, to, to manage those feelings often. And, you know, marriage is a great way to satisfy that need. And it's godly. There's nothing wrong with it. It should be a goal that we have. But, we need to under, go into that understanding some things. Understanding that if you go into it and you get yoked up with the wrong person, you're going to be like that ox and the ass trying to plow in the same plow, in the same yoke. And it's not going to work. It's going to be inefficient. <coughs> now, not every association in life is a yoke. So we see that God, it's very important that God does not want us to yoke up with unbelievers. Okay? And we need to understand that not every association you have in life is yoked. Now, marriage definitely is one of them. But there are a lot of associations that we have in life that are not necessarily us yoking up with unbelievers, is it? Because some people could take this to an extreme and say, and end up living in a convent or a monastery or something like that, or end up like, you know, just recluses in their life. But not, and if you would, turn over to 1 Timothy chapter 6. What's an example of us being yoked with somebody or uh, excuse me, what's, somebody, uh, what's an example of us having an association with an unsaved person that's not necessarily sinful or bad? Having an association with an unsaved person that's not us yoking up with them? Well, I could think of one example that we probably, most if not all of us, will experience to some degree or another, is working for unsaved employers or along with co-workers. Now look there in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 1. Let as many servants as are under the oak... Servants, right? This is talking about employees. Let as many servants as are under the yoke count their own masters worthy of all honor, that the name of God and his doctrine be not blasphemed. And that they, have belie they that have believing masters, let them not despise them because they are brethren, but rather do them service because they are faithful and beloved partakers of the benefit. These things teach and exhort. So notice, first of all, that it's, diff it's, not, it's not the same yoke. You going to work for your unsaved boss is not you yoking up with an unbeliever because of the fact it's the servants are under the yoke. You know, newsflash, your boss isn't under the yoke. Your boss is driving the yoke, <laughs> okay? That's the difference there. <clears throat> it's not, it's, you're, not, you're not in partnership with your boss. You know, you should have the same mindset. You should have the same goal. You should have the same vision, desire the same thing, make the company money. But it's, a, it's an agreement that, hey, I'm going to work for you. I'm going to give you my time, and you're going to give me money. That's what it boils down to. That doesn't put you in the same yoke with your, with your boss. Do you think the ox ever took the yoke off and turned around and went to the one driving and said, your turn. Give me the whip. I'll, I'll handle this for a while. You go ahead and get the yoke. That's not how it works. The boss is the master, and, you know, you're the ox. 
Or, you know, maybe yes, I don't know. <laughs> You're one of the two, right? <coughs> but that's the difference there. You know, we are, we, when you go to work, you're not in the yoke with, with your master. He's, he's driving that yoke. So that's not an example of being un, uh, yoked up with an unbeliever. So that I don't want people to get the wrong idea here that we can never, you know, have anything to do with anybody ever unless they're saved. Okay? Uh, we're going to focus in here on marriage in a minute because I think that's the, the most important one. But notice also the clause there in verse 2, it says, and they that have believing masters, showing us that he's talking about the, in, the, in, in verse 1 to those that have unbelieving masters. He didn't say, those of you that, uh, as many servants that have unbelieving masters, find another job and don't ever have anything to do with an unsaved employer again. That's not what he said. He said, look, count them worthy of all honor, that the name of God and his doctrine be not blasphemed. And he, re, you know, he reiterates that in, uh, in Titus, in chapter 2. He says, exhort the servants to be obedient unto their own masters and to please them well in all things, not answering again, not purloining, but showing all good fidelity that they may adorn the doctrine of our God and our Savior in all things. You know, your testimony as an employee is matters, especially to your unsaved boss. You know, you should take that seriously. <coughs> but 2 Corinthians 6, you know, I don't want us to get the wrong idea. It's not. It's is teaching us not to be yoked with unbelievers. It's not teaching us to just try. You know, just shun everybody that's not saved in our life. I'll read to you from First Corinthians five. The Bible says, "I wrote unto you in an epistle, not to company with fornicators, yet not altogether with the fornicators of this world." He's saying, "I told you not to fornicate. Uh, to, to excuse me, not to uh, 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 to company with fornicators." He said, "Yet not altogether the fornicators of this world." He clarifies that statement. He goes on and says, uh, or with the covetous or extortioners or adulterers, for then must ye needs go out of the world. He said, look, if, I'm, if you were to uh, you know, uh, uh, separate yourself from every fornicator, every unsaved fornicator, every unsaved uh, you know, covetous person or extortioner or idolater, you'd have to leave the world. You'd have to go live under an underpass. You might still bump into them down there. You know, you'd have to go buy acreage somewhere in some... Timbuktu and go live there and, and, and live off the land. You'd have to completely go out of the world, he's saying there. And he's saying, look, that's not what I meant. That's not what I want you to do. You see, we, we rub elbows with people who are, guilty of these sin, who are guilty of these sins all the time, whether we know it or not. You know, we're, we bump into them all the time. He's not saying, look, you know, make sure you, you, you uh, vet every person that you're going to interact with. You know, ladies, when you get to the grocery store, before you, you let her start to ring those groceries up, you need to ask her, are you an extortioner? Excuse me, miss, before you start to scam my groceries, you know, are you covetous? Are you an idolater? You know, are you a fornicator? Yes, I am. Can I speak with your manager? You know, <laughs> could you find me a, a cashier who's none of these things so that, I can, who, that we can enter? That's not what the Bible's teaching because we know, we, we, it just, it's not practical. We're gonna have to rub elbows with these people. He clarifies the verse in 11 and says, But now I have written unto you not to keep company with any man that is called a brother. So he's saying, look, don't, hang, don't, don't have anything to do with a brother that is guilty of these things. If he be a, co a fornicator or covetous or an adulterer or a railer or a drunkard or an extortioner, with such no one not to eat. So we see he's clarifying that. You know, when we're saying don't be unequally yoked with, unbelie uh, with unbelievers, that doesn't mean just completely shut them out of your life. Okay? It, what it's talking about is you don't want to get in these personal relationships. <clears throat> Go back there to 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and let's look at what's considered a yoke here. What's considered yoking up. And we'll get a better idea of what kind of relationships we need to be on guard about this with. 2 Corinthians chapter 6 verse 14 he says, be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers, for what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? Or, and what communion hath light with darkness? And what concord hath Christ with Beulah? Or what part hath a, he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? So he says, don't be yoked. And then he, and then he gives us these words to help us understand what he means by that. Fellowship, communion, having part with sharing in, right? And being a, a agreement with. These describe relationships that are personal. These describe relationships that are, are more than just your casual everyday encounter. 
This is talking about people who are going to fellowship together. They're going to commune with one another. This is talking about closer relationships. You know, this talks about, I believe you can apply this to friendships. You know, your best friends should not be the unsaved. They should be the saved. Uh, because they have an influence on your life. You know, you want to see where somebody's headed, look at who their friends are. That's how, I'll say a lot about them. What direction they're headed because friends influence one another. And we could talk about that, but I think this applies significantly in the area of marriage. I don't think there's any relationship that you're going to find on earth that you will ever have as close as that as, as husband and wife. And this is you know, where I really want to apply this tonight, this principle of stranger danger, as the title of the sermon is. The Bible says in Genesis chapter 2, Therefore shall a man leave his father and mother and shall cleave unto his wife. That's a, that's a very unique statement, to cleave unto her. This, this grasping, this holding on to, this not letting go. Okay? <coughs> you wouldn't say that about your best friend. You wouldn't say that about your buddies. You know, you're not going to cleave unto them. You know, they stop wanting to hang out. No, I got it. I just, you can't leave me. You know? Psycho. Right? <laughs> Stalker. Right? That's what, they, that's what would happen. But he's saying, look, you need to cleave unto your wife, and they twain shall be one flesh. I mean, that's how intimate, that's how close, that's how uh, uh, deep this relationship is between a man and a woman, uh, a husband and a wife. Go over there to Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5. So I, I want to just drive this principle in of, of not being... Hey, you sit up and you straight up and you keep your eyes on me. You understand me? So I really want to drive this in, uh, this principle of not being unequally yoked in the area of marriage. In the area of marriage. Because that's what's going to count the most. And <coughs> we don't want to fall into the trap of end up marrying somebody that we're going to be unequally yoked with. It's going to make life long it's going to make life hard, and we're not going to get done everything that we could get done for the Lord. Look there in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 22. Submit your, uh, wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. You know, that's not every relationship. It doesn't say women submit unto every man. Now, I don't believe in that. I don't believe a woman is you know, bound by duty to submit to every man. That's not what the Bible says. And some guys get this idea in their head. So let's just go ahead and nip in the bud right now. You know, you don't have to, just because you're a man doesn't mean you go tell women, other women what to do. You know, it says, wives, submit unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. And that sounds like a pretty serious relationship. Hey, you need to submit unto them as unto the Lord. <coughs> Look there in verse uh, 24. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. I mean, if you want to be pleasing to God, uh, uh, ladies, if, if, if you want to obey this commandment, you're going to have to submit to that man you marry in everything. In everything. So you can see why it's so important that you don't end up getting unequally yoked with an unbeliever. Because you're going to have to obey him. You know, in the Lord. Obviously, you, can, you don't have to obey your husband when it comes to if he's asking you to do things that are opposed to God or contrary to the Lord. But it does say in everything, doesn't it? He goes on to verse 25, Husband, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. You know, husbands are to be willing to make sacrifices, to lay down their lives, to lay aside their own ambitions, the things they want for themselves, and care more about the things of their wife. How they can please them, how they can take care of them, how they can love them, how they can nurture them, and help them, and, and, and lead them. So it says in verse 28, Men ought to love their wives as their own bodies. So this, this relationship is the most important relationship you'll ever have in your life, this area of marriage. It has, there's gravity there. You have to understand the gravity that it comes with the marriage relationship. And you know, this principle of separation is taught throughout Scripture. You know, all the way from Deuteronomy, we saw, and in, in 2 Corinthians, to not be unequally yoked with unbelievers, especially in this area of marriage. <clears throat> which means this, that a spouse should be chosen very carefully and very wisely. The person that you're going to spend the rest of your life with needs to be chosen very uh, uh, carefully and very wisely. You know, you should probably seek godly counsel in that area. You know, especially, you know, if you have, if you have parents, you know, <laughs> mom and dad, number one, right? That they should be, if you have saved parents who are, who are going to lead you and guide you in that decision making, 
uh, you know, you need to go to them. Uh, but mainly what I want to drive in the, is tonight is the fact that Christians should not marry the unsaved. If you're, a, if you're saved, if you're a believer, if, if you are, are born again, you don't have any business marrying an unbeliever. You shouldn't be unequally yoked with unbelievers. That's what the Bible says. It tell me a relationship that, that, that's more closely, uh, is more of a yoke than that of marriage. Two people coming together in the bonds uh, of matrimony and, 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 and making those vows one another, say we're going to live our lives together. We're going to raise children together. You're in a yoke with somebody, friend. That's work. Marriage relationship is, is, is wonderful, but it's a lot of work too. It's two people saying, hey, we're going we're gonna to go at life together. And the Christians, therefore, should not be marrying the unsaved. In fact, the Bible teaches this. I'll read to you in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Concerning widows, it says in verse 39, the wife is bound by the law as long as her husband liveth. Let that sink in, right? You're bound by the law as long as your husband is alive. But if her husband be dead, she is at liberty to be married to whom she will. And then he gives this on the end, only in the Lord. He says, look, she is lib at liberty, 1 Corinthians 7, verse 39, she is at liberty to be married to whom she will, only in the Lord. So that's the one, that's the one qualifier for that lady. You know, she's widowed, she's at liberty to marry, she can marry whoever she want, wants, but it has to be in the Lord. That's the one thing he clarifies there and says, look, whoever she wants, as long as it's a saved person, it says somebody who knows the Lord. And I mean, chose that title of that sermon tonight so that because we have a lot of young people in this church, praise God, you know, and we have unmarried people that, you know, one day there's a, there, there is a, there's a lid for every pot. I believe that. Okay. They're going to look for a spouse. They're going to find a spouse. Okay. And I want you to let these words settle down into your hearts and ears. Stranger danger. I know we're taught that when we're little kids, right? When a stranger says, Hey, come see the puppy in my trunk. You know, I've got some candy. Want to go for a ride? Stranger danger, right? Let's not forget that as we grow older and we start to look for a spouse. Apply that same thing. Stranger danger. And if you would, turn over to 1 Kings chapter 11. We'll look at an example, and actually where I get the title for this sermon, of somebody who failed to understand this principle of stranger danger when it came to this marriage relationship. And that would, of course, be the example of King Solomon. There in 1 Kings chapter 11, verse 1, but King Solomon loved many strange wives. Okay, so there's a couple things wrong with this. One, he's got more than one wife. The Bible, God explicitly told that the kings of Israel will not to multiply to themselves wives. And he did that. The Bible does not condone polygamy. That, and we've preached on that in the past. But he loved many strange wives together with the daughter of Pharaoh. Now, when it says there he loved strange wives, it doesn't mean he loved weirdos, okay? You know, she's got a bone in her nose and green hair, you know. It's not what he's talking about. He's talking about the fact that they are of a different nationality, okay? Because it goes on there, and it mentions the nationalities, right? Women of the Moabites, Ammonites, Edomites, Zidonians, and Hittites. That's what it means by strange. They are strangers in a strange land, as Moses said, right? So this isn't a matter of preserving some bloodline. God's saying, look, the problem here is that, that he was marrying uh, uh, you know, the wrong nationality. That's not what he's, he's, he's ref is the problem here. The problem is that he was marrying women that turned his heart from the Lord. These strange wives from these different nations, they worshipped a, a, another god. They worshipped heathen gods. And we'll see here the, the results of that. So this isn't about, don't get the wrong eye either, that, that God somehow is some kind of supremacist, you know, that God only wants a certain races getting together. You know, the Bible says that he hath made all nations of one blood. And, and in heaven we'll see uh, uh, tongues, uh, people from every nation, kindred, tri and tribe up in heaven praising God. And we could even think about other examples in the Old Testament of men marrying foreign women that loved the Lord, and it turned out good. I mean, think of Boaz, right? Boaz married Ruth, and that, you know, which led to Jesse, which led to... Uh, David, right? Which eventually led to Christ. So it's not a matter of that. <clears throat> you know, another, and, and think about this, Boaz himself, if you, if you look, study your Bible, Boaz was the, was the product of, uh, of an Israelite marrying Rahab the harlot when they, when they went into Jericho. That led to him. 
So there's, a, there's actually a harlot in that lineage of Christ that's given, Rahab the harlot. You see that in Matthew chapter 1. I'll read to you. It says, Solomon begat Boaz of Rahab. That's talking about Rahab the harlot. And Boaz begat Obed of Ruth. And Obed begat Jesse. <coughs> so, you know, I'm not saying we should go out and try and marry a harlot. But it's saying here, you know, Rahab's redeeming quality was that she believed. That she believed on the Lord. And if you recall that story, you know, she, was, she hid the spies by faith. <clears throat> the Bible says in Hebrews 11, By faith the harlot Rahab perished not with them that believed not when she had received the spies with peace. So what the Bible is showing us really here is that you know, you'd be better off, and I'm going to just say this, and, I, and, and it's true but because that's what we see here, you'd be better off marrying a harlot that got right with God than marrying some heathen girl. It's true. You'd be, mar you'd be better off marrying some uh, a girl that came from some dark past, with some checkered past, had a, a, you know, was a woman of ill repute that got right with God, than you would marrying some, uh, you know, some heathen girl who didn't believe in the Lord, but seemed to have it all put together. That's what, that's what the Bible's showing us. <clears throat> but Solomon here, he ignored this warning. Look there in verse 2. He says, uh, <clears throat> he says, King Solomon loved many wives together with uh, the daughter of Pharaoh, women of Moabites, Ammonites, Edomites, and Zidonians, and Hittites, of the nations concerning which the Lord said unto the children of Israel, Ye shall not go in unto them, into them, neither shall they come in unto you, for surely they will turn heart your way your heart after their gods. Solomon clave unto these in love. So he didn't say, you know, there's a strong possibility. He didn't say, you know, maybe they will turn your hearts after other gods. You know, don't get married to them. Don't have this. Don't marry intermarry with these heathen people, because there's a chance that they will turn away your heart. No, he said, surely, count on it, because there's a principle in Scripture: you never see the good making the bad good. You know, see a lot of. You see the bad making the good bad. And that's exactly what happens here with Solomon, and Solomon ignored this in this warning. And he suffers the consequences. If you would, look there in uh, verse 3 where he says, And he had 700 wives, uh, princesses, and 300 concubines. I mean, come on. How many, how many do you need? You know? His wives turned away his heart, for it came to pass when Solomon was old, that his wives turned away his heart from a, uh, after other gods, and his heart was not perfect with the Lord as was the heart of David his father. I mean, Solomon had that, that, that law that was quoted to him. You don't marry them. They surely will turn away your heart after other gods. And he ignores that warning. And you know what? God's word comes true. When he gets into his old age, after he'd multiplied all these strange wives, his heart's turned away from the Lord God. <clears throat> it says in verse 5, For Solomon went after Ashtaroth, the goddess of the Zidonians, after Malcolm, the, the uh, abomination of the Ammonites. I mean, here's, I mean, let that sink in. This is King Solomon we're talking about. He built the temple. He saw God. God came to him and spoke to him on more than one occasion. I mean, and here he is going after these gods. He, had to, he knew they weren't even real. But he's, he's going to please his wives. He's going to want to just make them happy. So he's just going to go after the goddess of the Zidonians. You know, a goddess. Uh, the, after the uh, Milcom, the abomination of the Ammonites. You know, he's worshiping something that God calls an abomination. That's how much they uh, turned his heart from God. And Solomon did evil in the sight of the Lord and went not fully after the Lord as did David his father. And then did Solomon build high place and high place for Chemosh, the abominations of, of Moab. And the hills that is before Jerusalem, and for Molech, the abomination of the children of Ammon. Molech. Now, if you study that out, Molech is who they burnt, uh, they burnt their children to. So that they committed child sacrifice to Molech. Now, I don't know if that was going on in his day. Um, I'd have to study that out, but that is that same God. And he's, and he's going after it. In the hill that is before Jerusalem, he's doing this. So, you know, it just goes to show us that you know, if you get uh, yoked up with the wrong person, they can turn your heart. I mean, it's bad enough they're going to make your life difficult. Marry the wrong, marry some uh, unbeliever, marry some heathen that doesn't care about the things of God, doesn't care about the Bible, doesn't care about the Lord. 
I mean, that's going to make life hard enough as it is, but it might even turn out that they actually turn your heart from God to where now you're just living like they are. And, and, you, and, and people be like, oh, you're a Christian? I had no idea. Because <clears throat> here's the thing. One's religion makes or breaks a potential spouse. I believe that. You, you know, that, that should be the deal breaker. You know, you get interested in somebody, you want, you know, start dating them, you start thinking about, hey, maybe this could be somebody to get married, uh, get married to. You know, their religion's got to come into play at some point. You have to consider that. Because it affects every area of your life. And everyone wants to just pretend like they can just keep religion over here, what they believe about God over here. As if it's, if you just, you know, I show up on Sunday, I show up, and we worship God for a little while, but the rest of the, the week, it, it has no bearing on my life. And maybe that's the case now, but hey, when you get married, and now it's time to raise kids. Now it's time to baptize uh, little Billy, right? And, and, and she's going to say, well, you know, I go to this church, and this is how we do it here. Well, I'm a Baptist, and this is what the, I know what the Bible says. And this is how I want to do it. Oh, really? And <laughs> now you're at odds in your own house over something like that. And I've, I've met people, I've known people where that, that's a real source of contention. It's, it's hard. Oh, and how are we going to raise these, these kids? How are we going to discipline them? Well, she's, you know, she's from the unsaved world. She's been watching Oprah and Dr. Phil, and she's read all of the latest and greatest you know, uh, fad child rearing that's out there. I don't know what they all are, because I, I don't care. But I'm sure there's some weird ones, right? She says, well, I'm just going to tell them that we love them and that he, we expect better from them and we're going to do timeouts and we're never going to lay a finger on them. Well, I know the Bible says, thou shalt beat. Yeah. Thou shalt beat him with the rod. That the, the rod of correction will drive the heart of foolishness far, shall drive foolishness far from him. Right. That, that I'm not going to spare not for his crying. See how that goes over in your marriage when you, when you have two different views on how you're going to raise children. Two different views of what you're going to teach them about the truth. Because every kid eventually asks, you know, where do we come from? How did we get here? You know, these deep, profound, like, you're too young to even think about that. You know? But they ask it, and she's going to tell them, or he's going to tell them, well, you know, uh, billions and billions of years ago, everything was as small as a period on a page. And it exploded out of nothing and became everything. <laughs> right? <laughs> Just enter the twilight zone. Right? But that's what she's going to want, or he's going to want to teach your, your precious little darling. And you're going to say, well, no, actually, the Bible says in the beginning. Oh, whoa, whoa, you can't teach him that. Well, stop. You see how important who you marry is? Especially in this era of child rearing? How you're going to live your life? It affects every area of your life. So it's Friday night. What are we going to do? Well, we, you know, one wants just to, you know, hang out and, and, and have some good, clean fun. The other one wants to go hit the bar again and get drunk and who knows what. It affects every area of your life. So, you know, it's a, it's a deal breaker. It really is. At least it ought to be. And, you know, we'll say, well, they're a Christian. And let me just give a little word of warning here today, right now. Christian is too broad of a term to be a qualifier. It's too broad of a term. Are you a Christian? Yeah, okay, we're good. <laughs> no. <laughs> That's not how it works. <clears throat> you know, find out if they're saved. Now listen, don't, I'm not saying that that has to be question number one. But if there's, you know, hi, you know, my name's so-and-so. Are you saved? You know, <laughs> I like you. Are you saved? I mean, it, it shouldn't be the last thing you ask. You should probably, before you get emotionally invested in somebody, that should probably come up. You should find out, hey, is this person saved? Am I going to break this off before this gets any? It gets it gets at all serious. <clears throat> well, then you need to find out if they're saved. And you know what? If they're not saved, get them saved. Amen. If you get them saved, get them come to church. Great. You know, maybe you can get that person you're interested in, uh, uh, you know, to the place where they are marriage material. You know, discuss that. Discuss their salvation. You know, and this is probably something that's more reserved, where, you know, mom and dad have given approved, or you know, if you're out of the house. Um, you know, this would be in your own discretion, but discuss how you're going to live your life in, in light of the scriptures with them before you get married. Before you get married, discuss whether or not she's going to stay at home and he's going to be the breadwinner. Figure that out before you get married. 
because that's a big source. You know, a lot of marriages end because of, of, of things like this. These are just practical. This is a very practical sermon, okay? You know, discuss the child rearing before you get married and have kids. And here's, here's my word of warning. We'll close it here. Don't think you're the exception. Don't sit there and think, well, I, you know, I can, I, can do, I can handle this. I know this person I'm interested in. You know, they're, they, you know they don't, they're not saved. They have a different worldview, but I'm, I'm going to change them, right? How many times have we heard that? Well, I, that's every woman thinks that I'm going to change him, you know, mold him into what I want him to be. Good luck. You might not be able to. I mean, you don't think you're the exception. I mean, Solomon likely thought, he, you know, could have thought he was the same thing given his experience with the Lord. Are you still there? In, uh, where did I have you? 1 Kings 11. Are you still there? It says, And the Lord was angry with Solomon because his heart was turned from the Lord God of Israel, which appeared unto him twice. God appeared unto Solomon twice. Well, that's why I made God so mad. How could you get turned so easily away by these strange women, Solomon, when I've come to you twice and spoke with you? He was accountable and had commanded him concerning this thing that he should not go after other gods. God came to him and spoke to him personally and explicitly said, don't go after other gods. And Solomon probably got in his head, well, you know, I, I, hey, I got this. I'm cool. I got the, I'm, I'm the exception. But we saw how it turned out. But he kept not that which the Lord commanded. So, <clears throat> you know, I hope we see from this, this, this sermon tonight that Scripture commands us not to make our closest relationships with the unsaved, especially in this area of marriage. They need to be saved. And you know what? It would probably be a good idea to even take it beyond that. And they should believe what we believe about the Bible when it comes to these major areas of life, like child rearing and and everything else that comes along it. You know, we, are, we should keep, we should not shun unbelievers, right? But we should keep them at our arm's length. You know, our deepest, our per most personal relationships should not be with unbelievers. I'm not saying be rude, I'm not saying be mean, but you know, we should keep that at a distance because it will affect our heart. And it applies in the area of marriage uh, more than anywhere else because of the severe consequences that come with such an influential relationship. Let me just close by saying this. The effects of that relationship, good or bad, are permanent. It's permanent. You only got one chance to get that right. So consider uh, these things when we look for a spouse or when we even look to develop relationships other than that of marriage. Let's go ahead and pray.